This is the Rich Dad Stockcast with Andy Tanner, the show that kicks 401ks in the asphalt and teaches you to be the master of your own stock investing domain. And here's your host, Greg Arthur. Hey everyone, thanks for joining the show. This show is about risk management and really it's about how to protect yourself, which is a pretty important thing. Um, as you know, and I'm sure Andy will tell you in a sec, every investment has risk. Uh, for example, real estate can take down to be taken down by a market collapse, earthquakes maybe. Uh, I think we saw what COVID's done to it. Uh, even gold has a risk as the dollar strengthens, gold's value tends to go down, or as we've seen in the past, governments can confiscate it. So um, as you know, Andy Tanner will tell you stocks have risk, but he also will tell you there's a way to manage those risks. So let's bring in Andy Tanner. Because uh, honestly, I'd like to compare Andy Tanner's thoughts with the common risk management technique techniques that most experts recommend. So, Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Greg. It's always uh, awesome to be here, and I look forward to it every single week. I, I do too. You you are taking a risk right now of being on the show with me. I, <laughs> I get a lot of com uh, complaints in the comments section. So. Uh, I disagree. I don't think this is a risk at all. <laughs> You're too kind. So, Andy. Um, do you want me to just list off some of the techniques used or do you have anything you want to start with? Well, let's start with the big picture, you know, before we get into um, specific techniques of, of how a person manages risk, you know, the, uh, I, I love the, uh, the be, do, have, you know, I want to have certain things. So everyone says, what do I do? But we often uh, neglect the be. And so let's, let's look at some approaches to risk. And uh, I'm an old guy. And so when I was a kid, uh, before they had Star Wars, they had Star Trek. You remember yeah, that stuff? Absolutely, the still watch that. And you know, I like uh, I often when I teach risk management, I will talk about uh, three people on the Starship Enterprise. The first one is you have Captain Kirk, and that guy is a risk taker. You know, absolutely. he'll he'll that they'll quote the statistics of survival. You know, it's easy. You know the the you know, we're going to go down here and the chances of taking on a Klingon battleship with no shields is, you know, 800,000 one. He says, yeah, but I'm going, you know, or whatever. Right. And so he's very bold. He's, he's going to go where no man's gone before. And, and uh, for some reason, there's always a captain's log. He never gets, never gets bit by the wrist. Right. So since every episode of Star Trek is the same, uh, they go where no man's gone before, force, they, they face a moment of peril, come out victorious, and then they do the captain's log. We need to have a character who's a pessimist, who is afraid every time. So Dr. McCoy, uh, that's his job, you know. Jim, are you out of your mind? Do you need a sedative? You know, you, you're going to go down there. Well, hell, I'm going to go down there with you, but are you out of your damn mind, you know, and all that stuff. And so he's a, he'd be a terrible investor because he doesn't think he can win. So you got one guy who thinks he can't lose and you got another guy who thinks he can't win. And both of those are extremes in attitude towards risk and temperament towards risk. And then finally, you got Mr. Spock who, you know, those Vulcans evolved out of their uh, limbic system. They only have a cerebral cortex. So they just think about everything logically. Andy, um, you sound like a nerd. Yeah, well case in point a trek only nerds watch star trek okay yeah, the so limbic system on spock come on so you got spock who just uses logic and he'd be the best of all because this is very important he doesn't have to deal with his emotions and so when we deal with risk and when we talk about risk the first thing to ask myself is well who am i when it comes to risk am i a risk taker, what do I need to become or what would I like to become in terms of handling risk? I have a saying I give my boys that says, always be bigger than your money. And what that means is, is you always hold money in the proper perspective because greed can cause you to take too much risk and fear can cause you not to take any risk at all or, or run from risk as if it was a bad thing. And so you have running from risk, you have embracing risk, being a risk taker, and then you have what you said as a risk manager. So having the right awareness of your emotions and what it feels like to lose money is a very, very important part of investing in any asset class because 
everyone has a deal go bad. Everyone has a lawsuit. Everyone has this, everyone has that. And be able to deal with those things are huge because you can find a reason not to invest in real estate, in business, in uh, stocks, in commodities and gold. You can find losers all around you and reasons and bad things that will happen, not just can, but will. So that's the first thing I would say, Greg, is, is to be aware emotionally that this is not like going to a job uh, where you go, you, you know, do some unpleasant task and get paid. You know, it's pretty much there for you. Investing is all over the place. You know, how much am I going to make is a question I always get. Right. And that's a job interview question, really, an E-quadrant question. Well, how much money should I uh, expect to make doing this? That's a, very much an E-quadrant question. Uh, if you move that question to the I quadrant, say how much money are we going to make? I'll say somewhere between a billion dollars and losing everything you have. How's that for a range? Because it really can be. So that'd be my first thought is the emotions of it. So Andy, um, here at the Rich Dad office, what, Robert actually has a similar problem. If, if he hires people that are too much in the go-getter range, we're going to fail all the time. And if we hire people that their first word out of their mouth is no, because they get analysis paralysis, uh, we get doomed. So what he does is he makes us take a personality test. Yeah. And there, you probably heard of it, the Colby test. You probably yeah, had to take the it. Colby. You, you and I have almost identical Colby scores. <laughs> you and I do. I'm sorry about For that. quick starts. Yeah, yep. so I'm, I'm a quick start, right? Every, yep. Everything I see, I'm like, let's go for that. Let's do it. Yep. And, then, and then my partner at Rich Dad, Rob, he's a fact finder. Yeah, that's so like my wife, thing, Marcy. Yep. Okay. So, okay, same with me. My my wife is a, or I'm the quick start. My wife is fact finder, and what what Robert does is he he matches up a quick start with a fact finder in order to create, in your, in your analogy, a Spock. Yeah. So I'm all yes, he's all no, and then we meet in the middle, and sometimes it's a yes, but with a lot of data behind it, and sometimes it's a no because the data. With a lot of data behind it. Yeah. So well, that's well, that's how Robert takes your your Star Trek analogy and applies it to entrepreneurship. I think so. And so, you know, when you, when you go out there, people say, well, how much risk should I take? And here's another important thing is when people talk about risk tolerance, you know, where on that scale are you going to put yourself on risk tolerance? Um, if a person does not have a, enough risk tolerance, there's some personal development to be had to gain some. If a person has too much risk tolerance, there's some personal development to be have. So again, we're back to the B, who do I need to become before I do? Once you get into that range, uh, then we begin to implement tools. Yeah, if you, one, one last thought on temperament, a great place to look at this is the casino. Is the casino is a mathematical apparatus that transfers money from one group of people to another legally. That's all it is. And as they play those games, there are certain statistical probabilities and maximums of winning and losing that are in the casino's favor. We'd like to be able to do that as investors. And to some degree we can. And when they do that with things called table limits and rules and, and things like that, and so if a, if a casino could not handle any losing ever, they'd have no customers because no one would have a reason for even having a shot. Right. So, but if they were blatantly irresponsible with their math and their systems, they would also go out of business. So they have found that ability to lose a little, but to have techniques to help them win more than they lose and, and off they go. They have a license to print money, really. And so we'd like to come to come come to close as we can. We can't do it because there's so many unknowns and things we can't control. A casino game is a very controlled environment, but it it does lend to the the where we talk about in the BI triangle about systems and your systems uh, can begin to be your first line of defense and your rules that you create um, there. So. So let's get into more. Now let's look at the do. What do I do? How do I manage risk? Are we ready to move on to that or no? Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to tell you how other people manage it and you kind of give a... Yeah, yeah we can name? shoot some holes in some ideas or support some ideas. You bet. All right. So one of the biggest techniques I saw is called the 1% rule. Uh -huh. So you, you never put more than 
in a single trade. It could be, in your opinion, the world's greatest trade, but you still, you, you have the emotional maturity by having yeah. a system to only put 1%. I'm a fan of that type of rule. Now, some people, depending on their skills, they might go more than 1%. But the idea that there is some amount, and, and the way I would rephrase it just a hair, instead of saying, you know, like, you know, if you have $100, I'm going to put $1 here. Well, I might put more than $1 there, but I might say, I'll only allow myself, I'll set up rules to where I can only lose a dollar. So I might invest five, but I can only lose one. Yeah, that actually leads into the second rule. But before we do that, um, so I I can see myself not going past the 1% because I'm far less educated, but you, you're extremely educated. So as an educated person, would you go higher? Like as your yeah. education grows, are you willing to say 3%, 5%? Yeah, I think, I think you, you know, getting into 2 and 3% is not... Not, and again, this is a range. I think what's more important is that it's not 75, right? <laughs> right? And that it's not 50. I think what's more important is that you have that rule. And then that is when you get a test to see if you're bigger than your money, because all of a sudden, uh, you know, Bitcoin comes out and everyone's talking about, well, I'm going to put all my money here, you know, and some people boom, some bust, you know, up and down. Uh, the Robinhood people put more than that in GameStop you know, with, with their, that silliness. And so when you say, look, I'm going to play, but I'm only going to play this big. And I, th that's smart. Okay. Okay. So we're having the we're rule is forward. probably more important than the number, whether it's one or three, definitely less, uh, less educated, take less risk. Okay. All right. So you mentioned uh, when you were explaining the 1% rule that you would have rules established so that you would invest 1%, but you'd make sure you wouldn't lose. Yeah, I mean, than... that's where options come in, right? Options, I, I would struggle mightily to trade stock without options, which is really what a 401k will do. Right, right. So um, in that, you're, you're really talking about hedging. That's right, is I'm going to spend some money on insurance that says, look, this is my worst case scenario, and that's a scenario I can live with, right? We're, we're going to have scenarios. Another important part of this is not just risk and reward, but probabilities. Here's a nice quiz for you. Um, high risk or low risk? No. Going to the grocery store and getting a gallon of milk. High risk or low risk activity? Low. High. Um, most accidents occur within a few miles of your home. The worst thing that could happen, and it has happened, is uh, they say, gee, you know, we're here eulogizing this guy at his funeral. What happened to him? I just saw on his way to the grocery store. Uh, someone was texting and broadsided him and he died. So the risk of going to the grocery store and getting a gallon of milk is death. That's the risk. So is it worth dying over? Well, yeah, because we have to figure in probabilities. See, the pro and people confuse that. Going to the grocery store and getting a gallon of milk has a very low probability of getting hurt, but it's still high risk. So the way I look at risk is I say, you begin this way. What's the worst possible thing that can happen? That tells me what my ultimate risk is. Okay, what are the probabilities of that? And then what can I do to mitigate that? Oh, I can wear my seatbelt. Oh, I can drive defensively. Oh, I can go where it's not rush hour, right? Oh, I can not text on my own phone, right? Um, I can reduce those risks. I'm still taking it, right? A piano can fall out of the sky, right? Who knows? Right. Um, but we have risk, reward, and probability. And what our fourth pillar of, of, of the four pillars of investing teaches is how investors can blend those three ideas of reward, risk, and probability. And once we have a good handle... It, uh, in our advanced options classes, we never get in a trade without labeling all three of those. Here's how much we expect to make. Here's how much we possibly could lose. Here's the probabilities of each of those scenarios. And once we have that, we start tightening up from there with adjustments, exit strategies, option principles, um, you know, things that, that, that help mitigate the risk from there. So Andy, um, normally when you would say probabilities, I'd be like, oh crap, I don't know how to calculate those. 
but from my understanding, I think you've shown me this before. You yeah. can go to a website, and if you know how to put in the proper factors, the website can actually create a, a, a what a probability an code. Yeah, it'll it'll show you what your probabilities are. Yeah, I mean, and those are not perfect, right? They're probabilities. They can go inside and outside. But, you know, we have things like standard deviations we can use, uh, Fibonacci retracements. We can use mathematical ideas. You know, all, all uh, insurance companies are about actuarial tables, right? The, the actuaries do their best to figure out these probabilities, and they're not, they're a place to start, right? But there's certain I'd rather consult that than not. I mean, right. the weatherman or the weather woman, the weather person, the meteorologist, there we go, I'll get that all correct so I don't get in trouble. The meteorologist, he or she uh, will make a probability, you know, 75% chance of sunshine tomorrow. Well, you know, it could be right or wrong in that. Um, but it's usually better to check out the weather than not at all. And then, hey, take your suntan oil and your umbrella just in case. Be prepared for both at the end of the day. Right, right. I just want to make sure the listener or viewer knows that there's software that helps you. Yeah. So it's not an unrealistic uh, no, thing no, you're speaking No, no, no. This is not, not rocket science. No. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Uh, and this is also to help you um, really mitigate any risk you take. And that is setting step stop losses. Yeah. That's so that's, one, I'm a big fan of that, especially if I was only trading stock. It's a okay, little... Can you explain what it is? Yeah, I mean, stop loss is what it sounds. It stops you from losing. And it's basically a line in the sand. You know, when people come to me and they want to do trades that I wouldn't do, you know, like a, uh, an IPO or something very risky, I say, well, first of all, let's look at our position size rule and let's put very little money there. And second of all, let's see how much we'd be comfortable losing if we're wrong. If we're wrong, we're wrong. Uh, and if we're right, we're right. Now, the problem with stop losses, they're, they're very imperfect. Better to have them than not when things go bad. But the headache is something called whipsaw, where the stock goes down, you know, you exit, and then it goes on without you, right? Because it whipped around a little bit. And so, you know, traders, particularly day traders, they have to use other data, some will use, you know, what we call an average two range, some multiple of an average two range, you know, we're getting into the weeds, but, but yeah, you know, again, the bigger picture is, yeah, have a stop loss, right? Now, where do you put that? And what's the secret sauce? And well, every stock is different. Well, you can get educated on that. But the idea that, that here's what, here's, here's a better lesson on stop loss than the, the weeds to go bigger with it. The problem, you know, what was the problem with the Titanic? Uh, I'd say their arrogance. Well, it could be, we thought the ship couldn't sink, so we were arrogant. Or, well, the captain was incompetent. Or, oh, they didn't see the iceberg. Or whatever. I will tell you this. The biggest problem, in my opinion, uh, that caused the Titanic to be the tragedy it was, was insufficient lifeboats is they did not have a life, enough lifeboats for every person. And so when they, and that, that speaks to what you said on arrogance, right? Is, well, this is unsinkable. And so the idea of getting on a ship without the ability to get off of a ship does not make much sense to me. Um, you know, you, 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 I would not get on a ship, a cruise ship with insufficient lifeboats. I wouldn't get on it. To me, that's too risky. Now the probabilities, are very low. Most people go by. But for me, that risk is high enough that even though it's a low probability, it's high enough, I'd say, no, nope, not spending my money on that cruise if there's insufficient life posts. So there's your stop loss is, okay. is how are you going to get out of this trade? How are you going to exit this? There are better things than stop losses, but it's a good risk principle for, for beginners, not that they should pursue it long term, but at least start that way to get some sense of risk management. There's a lot better ways to, to do it, less expensive ways, ways that don't deal with as much whipsaw. But I'm a fan of stop loss for the beginner, for sure. Okay, and this last one is uh, diversify, which comes in two, two, uh, two methods. One is to, uh, when you put your stock, let's say in tech, 
don't put don't only buy tech diversify into i don't know commodities and and other areas that so when the tech market crashes it doesn't take down your other stocks and then the other that i just learned is geography so let's say you are into commodities and and let's say you're mainly commodities in china then you might want to also look at commodities in india because they have different weather patterns they'll have different uh i don't know uh issues to deal with um in the in the like one could have an earthquake sorry for my last yeah. speech no, you're exactly right Ge- geographic risk is you freeze in florida well that wasn't expected was it now the orange crops did stuff like that right you know when you line up risks uh, i think i might have done this in my four pillars of investing book i can't remember but i think i list a bunch of these there's legislative risk, right? They changed the law. Now you can't have an internal combustion engine and Ford better adjust or they're out. That's a risk. Legislative risk. There's tax risk. Uh, there is uh, obsolescence risk is huge with pharmaceuticals and technology, right? Word perfect. Remember those guys? Yep. Uh, the eight track tape. Those are all victims of obsolescence risk, right? Netscape. Remember those guys? Uh, all victims of floppy disks victims of obsolescence risk. So you've got, you know, tons and tons, interest rate risk, geopolitical risk, but I will talk about two that, that, that kind of can act as an umbrella. Systemic and non-systemic are the two most important. A non-systemic risk is like British Petroleum breaks a pipe in the Gulf. Now they're called BP broken pipe, right? <laughs> And they break a pipe in the Gulf and their stock goes from 60 to 30 because that was now Apple's still making computers and Pfizer's still making neosporin drugs and they're all fine. That was a non-systemic problem. It was it was a problem with BP. So does that mean it didn't take the whole oil industry down? Only one company. Okay. And, and non-systemic risk is why they scream diversification, which I disagree with. Because diversification is saying, well, if I put all my money in BP and it goes bad, I lose all. But if I have 100 stocks and I've only put 1% of my money in BP and they lose half their value, I've only lost one half of 1% of my money. Hooray for me. But that does not mitigate a systemic risk where everything goes bad. For example, climate change, if Bill Gates is right in his new book, I don't know if he is or not. But climate change, that's a systemic problem. I mean, everyone loses there. Everyone does. There's not an industry that doesn't get hurt. Um, in my opinion, the bigger risk and more immediate risk than, than maybe that would be a fiscal irresponsibility and monetary irresponsibility. Those are systemic problems. If you have a meltdown of the dollar, that's a systemic problem. And so rather than diversifying, what I like to do is you know, Warren Buffett once said, uh, diversification is an answer to ignorance. He says, why should I buy 100 stocks when I only want the top 10? I'm going to do my research and try to find that top 10. That's stupid because now I know if I diversify across everything, I know I'm buying the bottom 10 for sure. I suck, right? He, he would never do that. He would do his fundamentals. He would check it out, try to get in the top 10. Um, but at that point, you'd manage risk from there. And, and, and see what you do from there. But just to diversify doesn't make much sense. So what I like to do as, I'm, as a student, as I'm still learning, you know, is I, I try to say, okay, what if the dollar drops? What are some assets I could have? Okay, what if the dollar strengthens? I look at inflation and deflation pressure as a systemic issue. If we have systemic inflation, where would I want to be? If I have systemic deflation, where would I want to be? I do like the idea of diversifying across asset classes, not for the sake of diversification, just to have a bunch of stuff everywhere, but very, but, but, but have limited position size in one place and have uh, multiple streams of income, I think is a better way to think of it is if one stream goes off, then you've, you've got some other streams. So I, I love, that's why I never bash real estate. And that's why I never bash business, why I never bash commodities, because I have all four. I, I think anyone who says, nope, only real estate, that's all I ever want. You're missing opportunities and you're all in one area that can, that can have a risk. Okay, but 
so first of all, that's that's what Robert Kiyosaki says too. Where I struggled is in two ways. One, the Warren Buffett thing. Like, if you know one is better, and especially if it's better for you, why not? Why not only focus on that? And and second, now I have to learn and become almost an expert or specialist in a multitude of areas instead of really focusing my education and my learning in one area. Like you just made four times the amount of work. Well, there's no question that uh, you can work for money or you can have money work for you. You know, in Rich Dad Poor Dad, there's work either way. You either work for money or you work to learn. And so, yeah, I, I agree. Now, don't, I wouldn't tell someone, oh, now I have to understand about tech to invest in tech and I have to understand about pharmaceuticals to invest in pharmaceuticals. Buffett doesn't do that. What all those companies have in common is a financial statement. They all have profits or losses. They all have income expenses. They all have a price to book value. They have all have a price to earnings. Uh, there's certainly the moat and the brand and, you know, things outside the financial statement. But, you know, you can tell, you know, I don't speak Spanish or Japanese or Chinese. And I don't know anything about a lot of those cultures. But if I was a medical doctor and you put anyone in front of me, regardless of where they're from, very diverse group of people, Blood pressure is blood pressure, baby, right? You know, pulse is pulse. Uh, blood sugar is blood sugar. And so you can, with a very narrow uh, focus on your financial education, you can do a fundamental analysis on any company, regardless of what it is they sell, because the lifeblood of a company is cash flow. And if they're not cash flowing, they're going to die. And, and so it doesn't really matter what they're selling. Uh, it matters are they doing the things that make a business healthy? So you can learn financial education, but you're right, Greg, there's, there's, that's, that's the problem with the advice culture. Oh, I'd rather just have someone else to take their advice than have to win the work. And that's the lazy guy's way to do it is I'll just get advice. Well, you'll pay for that advice with fees and also who cares more about your money than you. So, you know, decide if risk management for you is a life skill or a skill for hire. Uh, for me, I feel that that it's important enough that that I want to be involved and have my hands in that as a life skill. Absolutely, that's just me. So, Andy, we do got to wrap up, but is there any uh, last words you want to give on on your overall? Yeah, strategy? I would really. I, I if we failed to cover one thing, it would be the importance of options and insurance. One of the best ways to manage risk, better than stop loss, in my opinion, is insurance, because if I have my house burned down, I'm fully covered. And I think insurance, which is really a derivative, you know, options, those are the best risk management tools for stock investors out there. And to learn about those and how to delta hedge and how to position guarantees, places to buy and sell, um, those, are, those are wise areas of study. Other than that, um, you know, try to be Mr. Spock, work on the personal development, always be bigger than your money uh emotionally always be bigger than that money don't as soon as as soon as i start to feel pain panic and greed i know my money's become bigger than me uh, that's a good rule well andy thank you so much really appreciate it and i i'm sure the listeners like everybody worries about making the wrong decisions so risk management is really I would say one of the, maybe one of the top pillars of your four pillars. So thank you. It is, it is, Greg. I would say this, if a person's ner the, the thing about risk management, it takes the nervousness and fear out of investing, doesn't it? Because yeah. if I know my upside, my downside, my probabilities, now I have the fear comes from not knowing the outcome. But if I can look at an outcome up, down and side, say, well, this would be awesome. This wouldn't be too bad. And this isn't great, but it's livable. And those are my three futures i can live with all three of them well let's go invest right so when you when you have risk management in place it takes away the unknowns you know what if you knew that the worst you were going to lose is this much well i can take that investment then i'll do it i can live with that um it's when people are not managing risk and they can lose everything that they should worry about losing everything right right all right andy well thank you so much once again um, I always end the show with this. Andy has some free webinars you can watch there in the show notes. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, man. Bye.